living in a post nuclear apocalyptic world could be like absolute misery. And a lot of people, if given the choice with the full benefit of hindsight, might think, you know what, I'd rather just go up in a ball of flames quickly and and you know die on the installment plan from radiation poisoning over the course of months and starving because there's no food distribution and all the rest of it. So well, you, some people would just do nothing. A significant number of people would just ignore the warning and take what comes. This is an emergency broadcast. This is not a test. Welcome, everyone, to the Dad's Doomsday Guide. Today, we have Dr. David Welch on the podcast. Dr. Welch received his PhD from Harvard and is currently University Research Chair and Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo. He teaches at the Balsali School of International Affairs and is co-editor of International Theory. He is the author of Painful Choices, A Theory of Foreign Policy Change, as well as Justice and the Genesis War, both of which were award winners. Along with being co-author of several other books, his articles have appeared in Asian Perspective, Ethics and International Affairs, Foreign Affairs, and the Georgetown Journal of International Affairs, just to name a few. And today we've asked him to come on the podcast to talk the very talk about the very lighthearted and uplifting topic of nuclear weapons. Thank you, Dr. Welch, for coming on. Good to be here. I guess uh, to start, if you could let people know kind of how you got to this point in your career, was it something you were always interested in? Because I actually majored in political science as well in college. And I was always fascinated with international relations and that, those kind of subjects that really kind of the global politics of things. Um, but afterward, I was like, oh, man, what do I what do I do with a political science degree? Um, were you always interested in this? Is it something that evolved over the years? And how did you get to where you are now? It's a good question. I think uh, in the early years, I was mostly interested in being a fireman than an astronaut. <laughs> and I think briefly an architect and, you know, maybe briefly a lawyer and a doctor. But uh, in high school, I actually kind of settled on a career track of sorts. I really had two loves. One was philosophy and the other was international politics. And the love of philosophy was stimulated by a great course I had in high school, a remarkable course on the theory of knowledge uh, that was unconventional at the time. I think high schools are doing this more and more. But I really strongly recommend that high schools actually offer courses in philosophy and encourage any student to take them. So I had those two loves, but uh, I was always torn which of these to follow, because when you're an undergrad student, you know, you can't do everything. It's hard to do more than one thing in detail. And I kept switching my major back and forth between philosophy and international relations. And finally, I thought, to hell with this, I'm going to do both. And I... <laughs> I did it. I could only pull it off by cobbling together the agreement of, you know, faculty from two different departments to supervise this massive undergraduate independent study paper, which was on the philosophy of nuclear deterrence. Mm. And I was very proud of it at the time. I look back at it. <laughs> That's a little amateurish. <laughs> but, you know, it gave me a little experience with doing big projects and that big project paid off. But I honestly think, you know, my main love was philosophy. And if I'd had my choice, that's where I would have tried to make my career. But then Ronald Reagan was elected president of the United States and it scared the hell out of me. And I just had this sort of belief that I had to try to do something to prevent World War III. And so I, for the most part, you know, spent my graduate years working on security issues and nuclear issues in particular. And uh, I'm glad to say I didn't have to be scared of Ronald Reagan. Uh, he started off in a pretty scary way and he was really beating the war drums and making all kinds of threatening sounds. And it looked as though we might sort of skid into an accidental nuclear war. But to his credit, just, you know, a couple of years into his presidency, he himself got scared by his own policy. Mm. And he started to you know, shift gears and reach out to the Soviets to try to engage them in conversations about arms control and confidence building and did a lot to help set the stage for a soft landing of the Cold War. So mm -hmm. that, was, that was very, very gratifying to those of us who paid close attention to this. And I have a soft spot in my heart now for Ronald Reagan, precisely because he was one of these rare leaders who could admit he was wrong and then do a, do a 180. I know that's very rare these days. That's unfortunate. Yeah. And I think it gets worse and worse with the, uh, uh, I mean, the polarization of the country that's thrown around a lot, but just the, 
I don't know, maybe it's the social media, the 24 seven news cycle, the, the need to be on and kind of pushing your agenda 24 seven, because you always can get kind of hit or blindsided. I don't know. I don't know. It's just, it's sad though. Um, what about philosophy? I was curious. Cause you mentioned that. What about, what drew you to that? Um, was there a particular element in there that you enjoyed studying more than others? Or was it just the idea in general? It's a love of ideas. Mm -hmm. I just, I find it so interesting to you know, think about the big questions and, you know, it's at the end of the day, it's kind of frustrating because one thing you realize before too long is we're not smart enough. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know enough to answer the really big questions. But, yeah. But it's still important to wrestle with them. And I think there's styles of thinking that you learn in philosophy that are really very helpful in trying to tackle other problems. So my next big book project, a little advertisement here, is... Uh, Coming out in August, it's a book with uh, Cambridge University Press called Security, a Philosophical Investigation. And uh, I just got the page proofs Perfect. and I've been checking them out. Oh, nice. uh, But it's, it's a detailed look at, you know, under the hood at the concept of security and how we should think about it and how we need to reconceive our way of you know, trying to pursue security in various ways. And it's just been a lot of fun and a good chance to bring back together my two loves, international politics and philosophy. I was going to say, it's nice. You can circle back to that now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess getting into the, uh, the serious subject of nuclear weapons, nuclear deterrence and all this stuff kind of under, under that general term, I, I, for people who don't really know, I mean, for nuclear weapons today, how are, how do they work? I know there's fission for the atom splitting and then the hydrogen bombs is fusion. Are, are the hydrogen bombs more powerful? I never really knew much until I started looking into it a little bit more with this whole Russia, Ukraine thing recently when I've been older. Um, how does that work in today's kind of nuclear field? Well, you're right. There's really the two kinds. And the first kind was the fission kind. So uh, the very first nuclear weapons, the atomic weapons, they used to be called atomic weapons. The idea was you take a very large atom, uh, uranium-238 in particular, and you split it up. And that releases just an enormous amount of energy. A uh, very complicated engineering challenge, very complicated scientific challenge. Uh, but, you know, in 1945, the Americans, in conjunction with the British and Canadians and so forth, as part of the Manhattan Project, figured out how to do that. Uh, the other way of um, getting a lot of energy out of atoms is to fuse them together. And so the fusion weapon is the other style. And in the, you don't take a big atom and split it. You take two very small atoms and you fuse them together. So two hydrogen atoms and you fuse them together and form a helium atom. And that results in way more release of energy. So, okay. yeah, the fusion weapon or what we sometimes nowadays call the thermonuclear weapon. When people use the word nuclear weapon, they pretty much only mean really the fusion weapons nowadays because that's what most countries have if they have nuclear weapons they've got the fusion weapons they're just much bigger bang for the buck although you can engineer them and build them so that they're actually quite small okay and uh, you know the americans and the soviets in the cold war had you know nuclear detonation packages like you could carry around on your back and you know you find a way to strap it to a bridge over a river and boom <laughs> the river's gone the bridge is gone for sure <laughs> the river's not gone but the bridge is gone so you can scale them way down. And, uh, you know, in theory, you could build a small nuclear weapon that's so small that there might even be a debate about whether somebody had used it in a conflict situation. I think I saw, and it's hilarious because I was like, I follow different people on Twitter. I'm not, I mostly use it for news. And somebody had posted, retweeted basically what you had written. And before I even had contacted you, basically about Ukraine, Russia, and Russia's potential use of a tacti tactical nuke. And something small if they were to go down that path. And I thought that was fascinating because when I started reading about it and how small they can get them, what would be the, is it just to really get the job done when you talk about like putting it on a bridge or something? It's just, you don't want to mess around with a conventional, what would be the, I guess, the benefit of using that versus a conventional um, weapon or a bomb? Yeah, there might not be much benefit using a small nuclear weapon versus a large conventional one because uh -huh. they, they would overlap in terms of explosive power. And if you opted for the nuclear one, you run the risk of the reputational cost. So one of the interesting things about the history of nuclear weapons is when they were first invented, people just saw them as, you know, oh, these are just weapons. Uh, they're just big weapons. Uh, but over the decades, as you know, people began to sort of reconceive them and sort of look in detail at the effects they have. Mm -hmm. 
particular things like the radiation effects, um, they acquired a kind of a, a gloss of horror and people became sort of more viscerally horrified by the concept of nuclear weapons in particular. And so there's a stigma now. I wouldn't call it a taboo. A lot of people call it a taboo, but there's definitely a stigma associated with nuclear weapons. And I think that does act as kind of a fire break on a lot of leaders' willingness to entertain the use of nuclear weapons. It's surprising how few leaders of countries who have nuclear weapons have actually seriously entertained using them. It's just, you know, not a lot of upside. You, what you, you would only do it if you were desperate and if you really needed that big bang that you can't get with conventional weapons. Out of everyone um, that you have, well, your years of looking into this stuff, who out of what countries who have them are you most worried about using them realistically? Uh, well, that's a good question. I two different questions there. One is who would be most likely to use them under a plausible circumstance, and who would I most worry about? The ones I would most worry about would be the countries that like don't really have a history of thinking seriously and professionally about nuclear weapons and might be a little cavalier about them. Mm -hmm. And so North Korea would be in that category. You can you kind of imagine the, that's a weird regime and it's staffed with weird people <laughs> and, and and who knows what they think, right? But it's, yeah. it's not so hard to imagine that they could say, oh, well, we've got these nuclear weapons now, let's use them. And Donald Trump came into office, right? It, when he was briefed initially on nuclear weapons, his immediate question was, well, how come we can't use them if we've got them, yeah. right? So. <laughs> Like he just hadn't got his mind around yeah. you know, all the all the complexities of using nuclear weapons. Uh, so I would worry about sort of that kind of unprofessionalism first and foremost. Um, who's most likely to use them in a plausible circumstance? Israel. Oh, okay. I was Israel. really curious about that. Yeah, the Middle yeah. East. Yeah, Israel is a small country. Like they really see their nuclear weapons as their sort of last option to survive in case they're existentially threatened. Mm -hmm. And 1973, there was an active debate at the top of the Israeli leadership about actually using nuclear weapons against Damascus Jeez. because it looked like the Northern Front in the 1973 war was failing. Mm. And it was just the good luck that the tide turned on the battlefield that got Prime Minister Golda Meir to sort of step back. But they were, they were ready to go. They were going to use them rather than watch Arab armies swamp Israel. And how do you, I guess it's almost like a war game. How do you see that unfolding? If they were to use them, do you see Iran coming into that? I mean, how do you see that? Do you see like just an implosion of bombs going off? Cause I, I guess that's a worry, right? It's whether it's one nuke being used or it's, Hey, everybody's shooting them at each other. Suddenly, how do you see that? I mean, I know it's impossible to, you know, foresee those type of things, but do you see a chain effect once one country decides to start using it that it's going to roll into? Because that was the thing with Russia. It's like, well, if they use one, what's our response going to be? It all depends on how they use it. How do you see that going if like, it were to blow up in the Middle East? So this is the big problem with almost all thinking and writing about nuclear weapons is it almost takes place, almost all of it takes place in the context of a, a rational actor assumption. So people think about nuclear use in terms of cost and benefit and under what circumstances would people think it's actually worth the cost to use a nuclear weapon and blah, blah, blah. Human beings aren't calculating machines. We're deeply emotional. And, you know, what we have sometimes very different perceptions of the world than the people we're interacting with. And so it's a complicated psychological interaction. And so you can't really predict as you could with you know, like rational choice models, who's going to do what under what circumstance. And with Israel at the moment, fortunately, you know, Iran doesn't have a nuclear weapon, but they've been getting closer and closer to it. And Israel's response has been to basically try to kill people who are associated with building Iranian nuclear weapons. And they've gotten surprisingly good at that, like a lot of fancy targeted hits, mostly inside Iran. Oh, wow. Uh, but it's possible that the Israeli mindset would be, you know what? We have to assume they have it now, and we have to assume they're going to use it on us. So, so let's go. What's with the? Uh, I guess the intelligence gathering. Um, I was more more reading about your background and everything. I was getting more and more fascinated. Like all these questions that pop in my head because having a knowledge, I guess, of intelligence, how it works through governments over the years. Why has it been that Iran is so close to a nuclear weapon for so many years, but yet 
no one's really sure when they're going to get it, how they're going to get it. Is it just, are they that kind of cloaked in secrecy where we can't get any info out of there that's kind of reliable? And I guess the same thing with whether it's Iraq or whoever else over there, how accurate is our intelligence about who has a nuke, where this material is going in terms of proliferation? Do we not have a real good grasp of that? I think we have very good intelligence on who has a nuke. Okay. Uh, trying to estimate who will get it by when, that's a little bit trickier. Uh, but I actually think we have pretty good information, frankly, all kinds of ways of triangulating information to get a sense of who's close and who's not close. Iran has had a program for quite a long time. They insist it's a peaceful program. They insist that you know they don't have any intention to build a nuclear weapon. And in fact, uh, the Grand Ayatollah Khamenei has, has publicly said that under Islam, nuclear weapons are haram. They're forbidden. Mm. And, uh, you know, I don't think it was entirely blowing smoke. I actually think there's a strong feeling in Iran that, you know, these things are forbidden. Okay. Uh, but they still might think, OK, well, we have to have it for one reason or another. So let's hedge our bets. And that's what they've been doing. They've been hedging their bets. And they've been sort of positioning themselves to get, you know, closer to having a nuclear weapon if they ever feel they really, really need one. How close are they? Well, I don't have access to the best intelligence, but mm -hmm. uh, they've consistently been further away uh, than the Israelis have feared. So the American view and the Israeli view has not converged on this. And it's hard. Getting a nuclear weapon is hard. Uh, takes a lot of expertise, takes a lot of money, takes a lot of time. You need access to certain things that are hard to get. And, you know, once you get your hands on the uranium, you've got to find a way to enrich it reliably. That takes quite a long time if you don't have lots and lots of centrifuges. And, you know, it's, it's, Iran is not that wealthy a state. Its technical capacities are nowhere near what the Americans were or what the Russians or Chinese were. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they give it enough time, they'll do it if they want to do it. But how close are they now? Um, I'm, I wouldn't lose sleep quite yet. Maybe it's the uh, the perception of, you know, World War II. Oh, we, ha we had a nuclear weapon then. So why aren't countries today with mod modernization, why aren't they getting it faster? But I guess it's a, uh, you don't realize how complicated, like you say, it is to, to get those things. And then Israel, you said, is just kind of bumping off the scientists and different things as they come up and try to help Iran. Fewer and fewer countries have even been trying to get nuclear weapons, which is good news. Mm -hmm. Because back back in the early '60s, you know, the American estimate was that within 25 years, I think the number was something like 50 countries would have nuclear weapons. Jeez. So it's nowhere near that number, and a lot of countries have just decided, you know, we don't want them. You know, Canada's one. I don't know in Canada. Canada wanted nuclear weapon; they could get it in a couple of months, mm -hmm. but you know, no interest. And uh, I think that's because a lot of countries realize nuclear weapons are more of a pain. And a benefit. Mm -hmm. They cause they cause problems. They don't necessarily solve a lot of problems. And uh, so fewer have tried. And you know, my colleague Jacques Hymans has written a couple of really excellent books on nuclear proliferation. And one of his big takeaways is badly organized regimes have badly run nuclear programs, and so they're just really slow at uh, getting there, and often just fail. And Iran's a badly run regime. Okay. And how much of a worry is it for you when you talk about proliferation about these things? Because they always talk about state-sponsored terror, then someone slipping somebody something who would be more willing to do it, a terrorist organization. Um, how much of a worry is that for you? And I know you said we, we have pretty good tabs on who has nukes, uh, maybe the, the development process, but how great of an eye do we have on what's moving around, maybe from the old you know, Russia and different things? There was a lot of worry at the end of the Cold War that there would be loose nukes from the Soviet arsenal and uh, a lot of effort to try to account for everything and make sure that everything was under proper lock and key. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of cooperation between the Americans and the Russians in that process. Uh, and the Americans were actually quite clever. Um, they would pose as, you know, clandestine buyers and, you know, anybody who claimed to have access to a nuclear weapon or nuclear materials or anything would sort of bite at the fish hook mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and then the CIA would reel them in and, and bust them. Right? Wow. So, they won't. so, you know, we've done a pretty good job of accounting for what's out there. Uh, so I don't worry too much about that. And even if, you know, first of all, who's going to hand a terrorist a nuclear weapon? Like, yeah. Do you trust a terrorist with a nuclear weapon? I'm <laughs> not sure. I, but even if, you know, they did that. What's a terrorist going to do with it? 
I mean, it's not child's play to transport it to a target and to get it to blow up properly and all that stuff. This is all complicated stuff. And terrorists don't have the sophistication of states to mm-hmm. do these kind of complicated logistical operations. So I don't worry about it that much. That's good. I, I worry about states who've got nuclear weapons making bad decisions. Okay. And then I know it depends on the state. And I know you mentioned it briefly in, in the Russia uh, thing going on, is if Putin decided to actually want to do it, his generals would start thinking, okay, well, should he be in power anymore? And there's a whole, you know, obviously political interplay that goes on with when someone wants to do something like that. Um, and I guess I would imagine that's why North Korea is such a concern because we don't know how that operates, how much, you know, if he's literally has the button, he just hits it and it goes. Um, do, you, do you feel the majority of even the riskier states who have nukes have this have smarter people around that would be like, Hey, this is going to, this is kind of suicide for us. Or is that not, I know you're a rational actor again, you're trying to think about it (laughs) rationally. Um, how do you view that? Is it still the wild West in terms of some of those regimes? Well, I think personality does matter a lot. And so I'm a big fan of, you know, trying to reconstruct leaders worldviews of trying to, you know, psychoanalyze leaders and the CIA has a very good program on this. They actually have, leader profiles, and they assign people to try to work up in detail a psychological profile of every important leader in the world. And that's money well spent. That's time well spent. Uh, So there are a lot of leaders I wouldn't particularly worry about. Uh, So, you know, Emmanuel Macron, president of France, France has a nuclear arsenal. Would I ever really worry about Macron ordering nuclear weapons? No, it's not in the guy's character or personality. And I don't see this scenario that would persuade him that that would be something even worth worth thinking about. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, Donald Trump came into office, you know, got into a spat with Kim Jong Un, and you know, it was clear that the guy wanted military options. Yeah, and uh, it was also pretty clear after a while. We didn't know this at the time, but it was also pretty clear that pretty much all of his advisors said at every turn, "No, that won't work. No, that won't work. No, that won't work." And he got frustrated. Mm-hmm. So it was the fact that there was kind of a check and a balance inside the White House that really probably prevented the use of American nuclear weapons against Kim Jong-un. That's what's so scary about, I think, because I'm older. When I was a kid, you know, Reagan, I was was born in 82. So I was just a child and I was kind of shielded from a lot of that stuff going on. But now that I'm older and I have a family, it really dawned on me just how precarious it is that people can just literally start launching these things that could wipe out humanity. And I was just like starting to stress myself out. I mean, it's like to a point, there's no, there's no reason to it. I mean, you can't control it, but it made me feel how powerless I was in terms of this whole weapon system that could be unleashed upon humanity at any moment, just depending on someone, like you said, emotionally reacting. And that was kind of Yes, but there's no button, right? So nobody's actually just got a button on a desk and they hit it and nuclear weapons go off. Uh There there is a chain of command and there are other people always involved in, you know, from the order to use to the actual launch. And so there's always the potential that somebody in that sequence could say, no way, I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's encouraging. And, you know, we saw people in that sequence disobeying orders during the collapse of the Berlin Wall to, you know, shoot at people who were fleeing into Western Europe. There were border guards who just said, no, I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. And so you didn't have an international crisis because people disobeyed orders. So that's why I think if Putin actually did say, I want nuclear attack in the context of the Ukraine war, pretty sure there would be a lot of people high up in the Soviet chain of command would you know seriously question that is he ill do you buy into any of that stuff that he's like either dying or crazy or is he just wanting to have his legacy cemented and wanted back old territory i wish i could tell you for sure Mm -hmm. uh again I, i bet there's some pretty good intelligence on this i don't have access to it he certainly doesn't look like he's in as good physical condition as he used to look uh, so there may be something going on stories about cancer and so forth mm-hmm. uh, there may be something to that um, I do think he's behaving in a way that's consistent with an obsession about legacy mm-hmm. and um, everything he's done in the context of this Ukraine war fits with the story that says he sees himself as the savior of the great Russian nation mm. he sees himself as the you know the new 
incarnation of Peter the Great. And that narrative doesn't work well when you trigger World War III. (laughs) (laughs) So, and and it's pretty clear that all of his nuclear saber rattling that he's done since February has been blocked. Like we, apparently we've seen nothing tangible to indicate any increase in the readiness or alert status of Russian nuclear forces. So he seems perfectly willing to kind of hint at nuclear weapons use to get his way or try to get his way. But um, I think, I hope he's not the kind of guy to actually do himself in by using nuclear weapons. It's, it's mind boggling because he was, it, you know, outwardly saying he was so concerned about NATO, but yet he did the exact things to make that build stronger again. Like, Oh, we need to rebuff this and get it stronger. And now I want to join, I want to join all these countries. <laughs> and it's like, you, it seems so irrational his choices because it ended up leading to where he didn't want to go anyway. Um, but I, I, you yeah, see, to be fair, nobody predicted how badly the Russian military would perform. Yeah, that was crazy and, too. And how well the Ukrainian military would perform. So a lot of people were surprised on all sides. And is that obviously with our help, but I mean, we're obviously feeding intelligence reports about, cause all the assassination attempts that were coming toward him and everything else. And we were like, we're feeding them. Oh, right. Yeah. And then yeah. getting them weapons and yeah. whatnot. Yeah. They have, Excellent battlefield intelligence, and most of that is American. When they, when they first invaded, I guess compared to now, the odds of using nukes. Do you feel like that's off the table for Russia now at this point? I mean, obviously with the caveat that we don't know what he's thinking, but do you think it's getting less and less likely that that's a threat anymore? Hard to see the upside, mm-hmm. really. And if, if Putin had the benefit of hindsight back in February, he never would have ordered the invasion in the first place. Honestly, he's got to be sitting there and looking at this mess and thing. What have I done? Yeah. You know, like yeah. Sweden and Finland joining NATO, we like <laughs> NATO forces redeploying to, you know, Slovakia and Poland. <laughs> like Ukraine's going to be part of the EU much faster than it was going to be otherwise because of this. Right. So hey, maybe he manages to wrest chunks of Ukraine territory mm-hmm. away from Ukraine. But at the end of the day, does that satisfy his legacy needs hard hard to see do you think he'll be removed after this i mean the russians historically and the soviets historically do have a history of removing leaders that are really problematic Mm -hmm. so it's not out of the question because those things he's clearly pretty problematic yeah russia for russia yeah you know but the problem is he seems to have isolated himself with you know he's got a very small inner circle they seem to be yes men they seem to be true believers in his russian nationalist fantasies Mm. so the people who would like to get him out are probably not people with great access so it's not clear to me how that would work like tangibly yeah i was watching somebody and they were mentioning how they believe that the cia had people just crawling around the Kremlin and everything else. And, you know, obviously who knows, they're obviously not going to be in that inner circle maybe that he's blocked himself off with, but it gave me a little bit of uh, hope, you know, that our intelligence was there and we were like pretty embedded in Russia versus like a North Korea. The intelligence has been great. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Putin has to be beside himself (laughs) every time, you know, the Americans, you know, announced his timetable days before he was going to do it. And then he'd have to postpone his timetable. (laughs) You know, this is a guy who, grew up and cut his teeth professionally in the KGB Mm -hmm. doing counterintelligence. So he's got to be just beside himself. (laughs) Americans have such good information. I was saying, how much do the oligarchs, right? The, the, the rich, uh, uh, like kingpins over there, how much do they actually influence? You always hear them reference, we're we're sanctioning them. They got to be putting pressure on Putin. How much is that reality? Does they actually have a say in the politics over there or whether or not he even stays? So far, we haven't seen much sign that they're as influential as we hoped. Okay. Um, you know, they obviously they've got to be really unhappy. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, they got rich by tying their wagon to him. And now they're getting poor <laughs> <laughs> because their wagon's tied to him. And uh, obviously, they don't seem to have a lot of influence over him at the moment just because he's got that very tightly closed inner circle, which is full of ideologues. Mm hmm. So it would be the military that would take him out. I would have to take him out. His generals. Somebody. Yeah. I think. Mean, okay. Probably. When you talk about them having like 3000 nukes, I mean, how are these things maintained? Are they just kind of, how long does it take for them to start becoming not functional? 
how many can Russia launch at one time if they wanted to? Um, is it like you said, I think having nukes, you said is more of a problem sometimes is part of that, the maintenance that you have to do with these things and kind of like keeping them ready or keeping them stored appropriately. You do have to maintain nuclear weapons, Like mm-hmm. they can, you know, malfunction if they're not maintained. Mm-hmm. And, um, actually a lot of Russian weapons in the Ukraine war have been malfunctioning. Oh. So it does raise the question of how well they're even maintaining their nuclear arsenal. Oh, I mean, Russia is not as wealthy. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's kind of a middle income country, really, at the end of the day. Uh, so that's that's one cause of potential concern for Russia. They may not actually have a lot of workable nuclear weapons or some of them might not work just because mm-hmm. of maintenance issues. Uh, but, you know, the, the rule of thumb is that nuclear weapons are actually more bang for the buck than conventional weapons. So you might have to spend money maintaining them. But uh, you'd have to spend a whole lot more money on conventional weapons if you didn't have the nuclear weapons. Is there any threat to them? Because I watched Chernobyl recently on HBO, and I was like, ah, oh, horrified by <laughs> radiation and everything else. I know it's a different situation. But is there any risk to a weapon or a warhead having that occur on a smaller scale? I mean, does that have to take place over many, many years before they start breaking down and causing a hazard to people around them? Yeah, the nuclear weapons are only really big problems for things from a radiation type perspective if they mm-hmm. blow up as they're designed to blow up. Okay. And there's a common misconception that, you know, you can blow up at a moment's notice. <laughs> it's actually really hard to get them to blow up properly. Oh, okay. Like you have the timing has to be exactly right. You know, the triggering mechanism has to behave exactly right. And if that stuff doesn't work, you don't get a nuclear explosion. Interesting. Uh, or if a if a bomber loaded with nuclear weapons crashes or accidentally drops the bomb, mm-hmm. uh, this has happened <laughs> like more often than we care to think about in <laughs> history. Uh, what you get is you get splat, and so you, you got to go clean it up. But you know, and there might be some radioactive material in the splat, but you haven't got this massive nuclear fallout problem that you'd have if that weapon had gone off in a deliberate way. And is that by design or is it just that difficult to get it to go off? It's it's just the engineering. Yeah. It's, it's, there are, you know, things we now build into nuclear weapons to make sure that they don't explode unless, you know, we really want them to explode. So there's things like permissive action links. You got to dial in the appropriate electronic code. Otherwise the trigger mechanism doesn't arm. Uh, We've got environmental sensing devices on nuclear weapons so that if like the missile itself or the bomb doesn't actually experience physically the profile of forces that it would experience if it were dropped deliberately or fired deliberately, it can't detonate. All kinds of these safety mechanisms built in now. So that's much better than back in the 50s and 60s. (laughs) (laughs) And there was like none of that stuff, right? Uh, So the actual weapons are, are generally safer now than they used to be and and again so the real problem is somebody ordering their deliberate use okay and then everybody else in the chain of command obeying the order that's the real word and when you talk about yield and explosive power i would imagine everything today is just like way more powerful than what was dropped on uh japan um when you talk about yield what are we looking at in terms of what countries have typically, and then what are some of the biggest ones that are, exist? Uh, so the usual sort of strategic nuclear weapon that say the Americans or the Russians would have and would mount on top of a, a missile or you know, put in a bomb and sort of fly it around in a B-52 or something, those tend to be in the neighborhood of one to three megatons. Okay. So Hiroshima was 14 kilotons so a lot wow. smaller yeah uh, tactical nuclear weapons battlefield nuclear weapons much lower yield than that okay um and but the range is huge as i said you can get really very small nuclear weapons but you know just sort of sobering to think about one american ballistic missile submarine a modern one carries more in the way of explosive power and its nuclear missiles than uh, 50 World War IIs. Jeez. I mean, how many, how many realistically would it take to just wipe out the Earth? I mean, at some point, you're going to damage it so far uh, um, uh, environmentally. 
how many have, has that been estimated at all? Uh, you know, theoretical studies, like how many, yeah. would... a lot of modeling done on this. And this is one of the problems with nuclear weapons is, you know, Joe Nye often says they're muscle bound. So they're too powerful to be useful to you. Yeah. And, you know, they're going to backfire and you're going to suffer from the use of your own nuclear weapons. And, you know, there's a couple of ways that might happen. One obvious one is you nu use a nuclear weapon and you trigger a nuclear exchange that results in hundreds of thousands of nuclear weapons. All of a sudden, you know, all of your cities, all of your infrastructure, everything that makes civilization possible is, you know, blown up. Mm. Uh, but it could be even in a smaller use of nuclear weapons scenario that you, the environmental consequences are basically devastating. So if you, know, you blow up, say, just a few hundred nuclear weapons in exactly the right way, you throw all kinds of dust and ash into the upper atmosphere and you get global cooling effects and you know, agriculture fails and you, know, you have sub-freezing temperatures in summer Jesus. and you know, food, food supplies sort of disappear and supply chains snap. Well, again, you've got that sort of civilizational malfunction as a result of the environmental effects of a, of a nuclear war. There's not necessarily even thousands of nuclear weapons. So this stuff is, you know, always being modeled and debated. And I think it's fair to say that almost everybody agrees a nuclear war is a really bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> and you just, you don't want to go there. And so it's somebody who's in a particular, particular psychological headspace that's going to be the problem person who thinks you know i've got nothing to lose or i have no choice and it's it's that kind of person who you have to fret about yeah that's a scary thought i mean it's how many i guess theoretically does russia have pointed at us right now i mean is it uh, in the hundreds many hundreds could be targeted relatively quickly right so uh like actively targeted right now ready to launch on order within a couple of minutes probably none okay but uh it wouldn't take long to target a lot of these things and when you talk about the yield in some of these are much larger today when you when you i guess for people who can't like wrap their head around that those kind of sizes when you look at a city, like, are you talking if something's dropped over a city? Are you talking like a mile radius, two miles? I mean, what I would talk about the leveling destruction, the of the initial blast, how what yield is effective in those areas and how big are you getting? So this gets really complicated really fast. And a lot depends upon just the size of the weapon, you know, how close to ground you drop it. Mm -hmm. uh, even what the atmospheric conditions, the weather is at the time you drop it. There are lots of these variables uh, filter into it. But uh, let's say you take an average strategic warhead of one to three megatons, and let's say you blow it up uh, over Manhattan at, say, 500 meters height, something like that. You're going to have a, a series of effects from the explosion. So there's the immediate blast effect, and that's incredible amount of explosive power. Um, you're going to have an immediate radiation effect. Mm -hmm. And that's just both a sort of an instantaneous pulse of one form of radiation. And then later on, there's additional radiation effects having to do with a lot of the fallout and the contaminated soil that the blast kicks up. Um, incredible amount of heat is released in a nuclear explosion. And so you're going to have Temperatures up as high as uh, 100 million degrees Celsius. <laughs> Jesus. And like that's the, that's the temperature of the sun. Good right? God. So we can't even imagine this, to be honest. Um, so if you're under that, you're just pretty much, it's just vaporized. If a lot of things would be vaporized. If you're right at ground zero, you know, a lot of things get vaporized. A lot of things get knocked down by the blast. A lot of things get burned up in the subsequent fire. There could well be a firestorm afterwards, right? That's a common effect effect both with conventional and with nuclear weapons mm -hmm. and then you have the radiation effects so there's a variety of ways in which a nuclear weapon can ruin your whole day um, but uh, those effects tend to kind of like dissipate relatively quickly with distance okay so if you sort of thought of a map of the destruction likely destruction over manhattan with a one to three megaton airburst nuclear weapon a uh, big chunk of manhattan would be just wrecked uh, but, you know, you get to Brooklyn and you 
Now a lot of things are standing. You get to Staten Island, a lot of things are standing. You get to Newark, New Jersey, the damage gets dramatically less at that distance. So most of the really scary effects, not all of them, most of them kind of drop off as the inverse square of the distance okay. from, from the epicenter. And I guess, is it more advantageous to have the nuke detonate above, like you said, in the air versus actually impacting the ground? Why, why is that? That depends on what you want the bomb to do. Okay. And you'll, you'll actually program it to explode at a certain altitude, depending upon what you want to achieve. So, you know, you might have some reason for wanting a ground burst, like make sure the thing gets as close to the ground as possible. Uh -huh. uh, or you might want to put it as high as possible. There's in terms of like the radius of destruction, there's kind of a sweet spot depending on the actual yield of the device. And there's a curve, you can plot it out on the curve. And so you would sort of probably pick your detonation altitude that way a lot of people think about this can you imagine being the guy who goes to work in the morning and this is what they do <laughs> and, and then you go home and watch netflix yeah <laughs> like i just don't know how people do this like, there must be a lot of you know compensation and a lot of alcoholism involved <laughs> yeah. um yeah it's really but, but it's all it's all very scientific it's all terribly scientific and it's kind of spooky so if you if you detonate above ground, I guess would that be fair to say that it would to cause the most casualties and to kind of wipe out what's on the surface there, and then maybe you want an impact if something's underground or something's down where you want to get it get into. Yeah, if you want to destroy a sort of a deeply embedded target, hardened target, you want to have it the weapon blow up as close to that as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. And there's even some technologies for like ground penetrating warheads. Yeah. So the idea that. is, you know, they they bury themselves into the ground some distance before they blew up, blow up. That's a real engineering challenge. Oh man. Right? Because, yeah. you know, as I said, to get a nuclear weapon to blow up, everything has to work right. And if you whack that thing into the ground <laughs> at high velocity, you know, something might go wrong in the mechanisms that get it to blow up. So it's really tricky engineering challenge. It, uh, but if you, if you just want to kind of like bathe, say the Eastern seaboard of the United States in an electromagnetic pulse and knock out, electronics and communications equipment then you want to detonate as high as possible right because mm -hmm. you, you won't have particularly a lot of ground level destruction but you'll get this enormous area in which like the electronic circuits are fried if they're not properly shielded against electromagnetic pole that's a really uh, a good point I, I didn't even think about that and probably a lot of people don't they think about the horrific like burning and like all the horrific uh, effects of a nuclear blast, but they don't think about the, like the EMP type side of it, knocking out like a grid. I mean, is that going to be, um, I guess the question would be how much are we prepared for that in terms of fortifying these kind of circuits or whatever it is, or are we pretty much just open to this attack? Yeah. Your cell phone and mine are toast. Okay. Cause these things just aren't engineered to withstand EMP. Mm -hmm. Uh, but <laughs> I would hope that critical government systems are, yeah engineered to withstand EMP. Yeah, because you always hear stories about how, oh, we're not prepared for this hack or this cyber attack or this EMP blast. Yeah. It would knock out all of you. You know, and it's just like, geez, you guys. I mean, I assume if it's being broadcast in the media, maybe there's some point of this being released to the public. I don't know. I feel like, you know, nothing's by accident. You know, they're not going to be like, yeah, let everybody know we're in we're deep crap if someone attacks us this way. EMP is a problem we've known about for 40 years. So, mm -hmm. you know, we've had a lot of time to think about it and to try to protect the things we really care about from that in particular hacking mm -hmm. is tough because the techniques of hacking of hacking change all the time. Yeah. And you're kind of playing catch up with hackers and trying to anticipate what they might do to try to penetrate critical infrastructure systems and so on. So that's kind of a cat and mouse thing. And it's uh, trickier to be proactive in protecting those things. Yeah. I didn't even think about what hacking a, a launch codes or anything like that. It's got to be really... I mean, I would imagine we put a lot of effort and uh, technology into defending that kind of thing. One would hope so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned... I say, so if it detonates above ground, uh, I guess it, it sucks up particles and debris and then like spews it up into the atmosphere. Is that what and you mentioned, I think, before about the, kind of the devastation in terms of like screwing up the, the sun and everything else? Um, would that be what they call a nuclear winter? Yeah, if you had enough ground burst, like it kicked enough dust and soil and ash up into the atmosphere, 
yeah, it can linger up there quite a long time. I was going to say how and, long. And so, uh, on the time scale of months, wow, to, to a year, two years, somewhere in there. So the, the models are getting better here, but uh, there's some uncertainty. Uh, sort of the rough analog. I don't know if you remember. There was a volcano blew up in the Philippines. I think it was 1992, Mount Pinatubo. Mm, yeah, we had spectacular sunsets for about eight months because of all that dust and ash up in the upper atmosphere. But uh, that was a cool season. I mean, temperatures that year were dramatically below what they typically were wow. because, you know, sunlight was being shielded by all yeah. this ash pumped up. So that, actually, that's what a nuclear weapon does. It's the same thing. I guess that's a silver lining. <laughs> if they drop nukes, we'll have some nice sunsets for a yeah. while as long as we don't get hit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How fast would a nuclear weapon get? Because there's been a lot of talk about if Russia launches them, the way they arc over, it's like a matter of minutes, like 30 minutes, 45 minutes to hit like any city. Um, I could be butchering that severely. So is that true that they're pretty much on a minute time frame now in terms of someone launching it and actually impacting a U.S. city or Canadian city? 20 to 35 minutes, typically, depending on the launch site and where exactly the target is. So you're talking less than an hour for a ballistic missile strategic ballistic missile. Uh, Soviets and others are working on hypersonic weapons. These are significantly faster. Uh, so, you know, I haven't seen the data on these, so I, I have to guess really, but um, hypersonic weapons, I think, tend to be more, you know, they're not sort of launched in this space so much as they're very fast cruise missiles. Okay. So they, they dodge defenses and so on really easily. I still think they would actually take a fair amount of time. I'd have to think about that one more carefully. Um, but of course, the old fashioned way, dropping a bomb, a nuclear bomb, well, you have to get the aircraft there and then they have to, you know, once they enter the airspace, they have to get to the target. So that can take hours and hours. Do you think they would, I guess, with the whole like, you know, analyzation of this topic that plays out from experts, do you think they would hit military installations first, big cities, they go for fear, shock? What's the kind of consensus about how a uh, Russia, for example, or North Korea would go about it? I can't speak too much to North Korea because that place is mysterious. <laughs> so I honestly don't know anything about their targeting strategy doctrine. He just hates, hates the beach, so he'll hit LA first. <laughs> yeah. I mean, traditionally, North Korea's main strategic move has been to threaten Seoul, it's like a massive artillery bombardment of Seoul. Seoul is quite close to the border. Mm -hmm. It's within range of normal artillery and North Korea has lots of it. Um, you know, they probably would try to use nuclear weapons if they felt desperate to attack American bases because they feel mostly threatened by American military forces. Mm -hmm. So that would be my guess, but that's strictly a guess. Um, the Americans and the Russians and so on, they've just got these really thick books full of options. And so there's different targeting scenarios, different targeting options for different scenarios. And Jeez. it would depend entirely on, you know, what they thought their problem was at any given time, what they might want to attack. And, gotcha. Uh, there are, you know, counterforce strategies, which involve targeting your weapons on the other guy's weapons. Um, there are, you know, counter value strategies and that's a real good euphemism for killing a lot of people, right? So counter value strategies would target cities. Okay. And you've got sort of intermediate mixes of those. You've got smaller scale use scenarios, big scale use scenarios. So it really depends on the situation and what somebody thinks is actually going to do them some good. And as I said earlier, the answer is almost always nothing. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's just really hard to imagine yeah. a scenario where it's going to pay off to do this. Yeah. You, yeah. Like to your point, I think it would be that you either lost it or you think that you're going to get invaded or something. And I think that was one of the things that analysts kept saying is you need to give Putin an off ramp to get out of it. Cause if you cordon off everything and you make him feel like you're about to invade his country, then obviously that's going to increase the use of, Hey, I'm going to actually use this nuke or something against somebody. Um, I've heard that someone mentioned that, they wouldn't just send one nuclear warhead, especially if you're talking about a Russia who has many. They're going to send multiples to each location to make sure there's no malfunctions or any problems. Is that just kind of fear mongering? That's us guessing. Okay. Yeah, we, we wouldn't say for sure. 
I've always, I don't know, the older I get, the more pessimistic I get about government and what they tell us and stuff. And I heard a story, I think it was Christopher Mellon, I think his name is, on Joe Rogan. And in the monks talking about UFOs and stuff, he mentioned how once in Washington, D.C., there was a threat of a nuclear explosion or a dirty bomb or something. They notified the politicians they were evacuated, some of the high, higher levels of government, but the public wasn't told, obviously, because they wanted to avoid a panic. Luckily, nothing happened. But it was weird to hear him say that. I'm just like, well, yeah, I mean, I, I know that stuff happens, but I worry that maybe it happens more. And then if somebody did send a nuke our way or there was a really close threat of it, do you think that the government would be honest about that actually happening? Mm, probably they would not. So um, very commonly, well, first of all, number one priority for any government is to save the government officials. So all of the emergency plans involves, you know, relatively rapid evacuation of the president, vice president, uh, key cabinet ministers, and so on and so forth. Uh, if you remember during 9-11, like the Secret Service swooped in on President Bush when he was reading stories to a kindergarten class and they bundled him onto Air Force One and they just flew it around. Yeah. Because they had no idea you know, what else might be coming where and they didn't want him on the ground and potentially vulnerable. So a lot of effort to protect the leadership. Uh, but there's also a lot of desire not to trigger panic. Mm hmm. And governments do a lot of emergency planning. And one of the big questions that they try to deal with is how do we prevent a high level panic? And some of that involves just not sharing information. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in the Fukushima nuclear disaster back in 2011, Japanese officials were not forthcoming about what was actually happening inside that nuclear plant. And they mm -hmm. were not forthcoming about the meltdown or the explosion of the containment lid and then they kind of soft pedaled the radiation threat for quite a long time it was all just to avoid panic and they knew that that's what they were doing they knew they were lying to the japanese people mm -hmm. but they felt this was the right thing to do i actually think that was the wrong thing to do mm -hmm. i think people actually prefer being told what's what and i think we're less skittish about things than a lot of leaders tend to think and so do you, do you think there's a point where they would actually say, I mean, would the missile have to be like flying to like, Hey, shelter in place. Is that pretty much when they would let you know what's going on? Yeah. If they had unambiguous knowledge that there was an imminent nuclear attack, they would almost certainly sound the alarm right away as broadly as they could just mm -hmm. to give people a chance to, to cover. Okay. And, uh, you know, we used to do this in school. You're not old enough for this because they discontinued this in like 1965, but we used to practice duck and cover. Yeah. In school. And uh, we had tests of the emergency broadcast system. I, I, I moved away from the U.S. in 1971, so I'm not sure if you guys still do this anymore. But it used to be that the television stations would sort of interrupt themselves periodically and they'd be like, this is a oh, test of the emergency yeah. broadcast system. Yeah. Does that still happen? You know, because we don't, I don't even watch like cable TV anymore. Yeah. It's all like streaming <laughs> services. Right. So they would have to <laughs> interrupt Netflix, yeah. you know, with, Hey, you're about to get nailed. So yeah. that's a good, that's a really good question. I think we get the cell phone warnings now. So up yeah, here exactly. we have this cell phone, yeah. cell phone emergency. You know, yeah. Thing. That would go out, which is like find shelter now. Yeah. And do we have a ability to shoot these things down? Um, I, there's a lot of talk about these systems that, well, I, I've heard some generals when I guess Russia was kind of saber rattling, like, Hey, we might use nukes. I think one of the guys came out and said, hey, we're, we're confident we can defend the homeland. Are they really confident? How many would get through? How accurate are these things? I heard a while ago that they're not as accurate as they try to depict. But obviously, I'm, I'm, technology is always evolving. Uh, how do you see it? So if you're talking about a, a ballistic missile attack, mm -hmm. shooting down a missile is tricky. I mean, you're basically trying to hit a bullet with a bullet. Uh, there are systems designed to do that. And they've been tested. And whenever you read about a test, you almost always read that the test was successful. Mm. Uh, but these aren't real world condition tests, right? So the guys operating the anti-ballistic missile system, the ABM system, they're sitting there looking at their clock, waiting for word that the thing has been launched that they're going to try to shoot down. And then at the appropriate time, the thing is launched and it's only ever one. <laughs> and like, and they're tracking it. Right. They're looking at it full time. <laughs> and then, you know, they fire their interceptor when they think it's the right time to fire their interceptor. And you know, then the news report is it was successful. 
So real world situation is nobody gets that kind of warning. The operators, some of them might be sitting where they're supposed to sit, but some might be in the men's room. <laughs> Uh, there might be like a hundred different missiles coming in, and you know these missiles often have multiple warheads, and oh. so you know missile gets to a certain point, and then bing, all the different <laughs> warheads go off. So I'm not betting a lot of money on successfully intercepting anything. That sounds terrible. <laughs> uh, what about I guess so? I guess hypersonic then just totally m- makes everything we build up to trickier. this point much trickier. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, these things are going to get through. Um, okay. You know, even if you have a success rate of 90% in shooting down nuclear missiles that are launched at you, it doesn't take a few to get through to ruin yeah. your whole day. <laughs> so it's almost like, what's the point? You heard, I guess I heard you heard that the U.S. was kind of lagging in the, the hypersonic uh, development. Is that true? Have we caught up to Russia now? Because I know Russia would put out those videos like, see, you know, governments tend to do like, look, and then we modeled the U.S. like smashing Washington, D.C., you know, <laughs> it's like, ah, um, are we we spend so much on military. And I like to think that we're, you know, obviously by our performance through Ukraine and kind of funneling them information and weapons and stuff, we're pretty high up there. Are we outpacing these people or, or has there been a lag in kind of the hypersonic development of either defense systems or missiles themselves? Putin's really good at announcing successful things that are not yet fully successful or fully operational. Mm. So I don't entirely believe Putin's claims to have mastered hypersonic missile technology. They've probably got some systems that work some of the time almost as well as they hope, but I wouldn't bet a lot of money that these things are terribly good. One of the missiles that was launched into Western Ukraine, they actually claimed was a hypersonic missile. Yeah. And uh, it missed its target fell into the field and didn't explode. Right. So, okay. If that's the best they got, maybe they talk a better game than they've got. Uh, Americans don't tend to announce a lot of things. Uh, They tend to keep the capabilities a little bit closer to their chest in part because, you know, they want others to fear American capabilities and uncertainty can contribute to fear. Mm. So don't necessarily advertise it too much. So I wouldn't, I think the United States is very far behind anybody in this stuff, if at all, and it could well be ahead. I guess if we if we shift this to a pointed, I guess, example, and so say uh, one of these countries launches a nuke, it's on its way here. Um, there's I've read a lot about this uh, <laughs> once you, the Russia thing was going on. It's like I because I never really understood like do you actually have a chance about surviving one of these things? And obviously, if the farther out you get, you do. Uh, the radiation becomes a problem. But if you know a missile's coming and say it's going to blow up within an you know, eye shot, I know there's a lot of talk about light blindness and everything else that can happen and when it's coming in. What should someone do, a family do, right? They get alerted. Where do you go? Kind of what do you look for? I imagine a house is better than nothing, but it's not great. Should you try to move on to something else? What would be, I guess, the action plan once you get the warning, right? A nuclear blast is going to hit and you're just maybe outside of a major city where it's supposed to hit. First question would be, do you want to survive? <laughs> and and that's not a flippant question. Yeah. Living in a post-nuclear apocalyptic world could be like absolute misery. And a lot of people, if given the choice with the full benefit of hindsight, might think, you know what? I'd rather just go up in a ball of flames quickly and than, you know, die on the installment plan from radiation poisoning over the course of months and starving because there's no food distribution and all the rest of it. So well, you, some people would just do nothing. A significant number of people would just ignore the warning and take what comes. But if you really do want to survive, um, point number one would be get deep underground as fast and as far as you can. Mm-hmm. Like you duck into the subway, duck into the parking garage. Concrete is a really good shield for blast effects and a really good shield for radiation effects. Um, if you are outside of a city and you've got a, a route to get out into the mountains of Pennsylvania or something, take it because you're going to be much safer out there. Uh, distance is key. And if you can't get distance, then you want very strong, sturdy things between you and the nuclear explosion. And when you not talk- your house, not your house, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's- like if that's all you've got, great. But. You know, in my public school, when we did duck and cover, our designated nuclear 
uh, shelter was the basement of this brick building built in the 1940s. And it wasn't engineered to protect you from anything, to be honest. So that was probably not worthwhile, but it was the best we had. So that's where you go. So you are you asking pretty much for just nasty radiation poisoning if you're going to be in your home with your kids, you know, because that's it's funny you say that, like, do you want to live? And I think my only instinctual thing would be, yeah, I mean, yeah, you probably have like a flight, a fight or flight response and like you initially want to survive. But if you think about it, if I didn't have kids, you know, it might be a different answer. But if you have kids, you're going to have that, you know, like you want to protect them kind of thing. And I just think how terrible that would be realizing like, oh, this thing's descending on us and I'm stuck in my home. You know, because in California, yeah. there's like no bunkers. There's no, there's like, where do you go? You know, everything kind of got removed. I guess I was reading about it after the Cold War fears. They converted it back to like actual storage stuff. Yeah. Well, actually, almost all civil defense programs wound up in the 60s because people realized, you know, you can't really protect a large population against massive nuclear war anyway. Um, I do think if you have children, you're much more likely to try to protect them. I mean, that's hardwired into us. Mm -hmm. Uh, So you're not going to just take it if you've got young kids as easily as if you're, you know, single and you've been striking out on (laughs) match.com. But, uh, (laughs) <laughs> so do you, yeah, do you, do you, do you not stay in your home under any circumstances? Because I know a lot of people say just get under something, but yeah, but I don't want to see us melting away. My kids horribly suffering. If you want to survive, you, you get to the best shelter you can in the time you think you've got available and it might be your home, but like in, in Seoul, it's the subways and parking garages and you can fit the entire population of the city of Seoul in the subways and parking garages because mm-hmm. they're designed to be shelters in okay. case of war. And that's brilliant advanced planning. But we haven't done that. But, you know, there are a lot of deep underground garages in Manhattan. And I would head right down to those and get to the lowest possible level and, you know, hope to ride it out successfully. It's even better if you can just sort of get away from the blast. Okay. And what about, I guess, like a high rise or an apartment building? Say you have nothing underground in the vicinity. Is it better to go into... A, a taller building kind of, I've heard get to the middle floor in the center of the room and try to get as far as away from the edges. Is that better than being in a home, a normal, like one story house, or are you just kind of equivalent and doesn't really matter? Tall buildings likely to be pretty big in the horizontal dimensions. Uh-huh. So, you know, if you can get to the center of that, that's probably not a bad move. Okay. You know, like the elevator lobby of an office building, that mm-hmm. may be a pretty good place to be because there's likely to be lots of stuff between you and the blast. Okay. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go up. <laughs> <laughs> like you're going to get stuck up there or the building might get blown over or something like that. You don't want to go up particularly. And after the initial blast, say you survive that initial shock wave that it doesn't like just obliterate the building you're in, you're far enough away. Is there, how many shock waves are there? Are some, I read somewhere there was like two and then like there was like this wind that comes after. I mean, what, how many, I guess, passes are you looking at to stay inside before like, oh, I need to find better shelter? So again, it depends on the type of weapon and whether how big it is and whether it's been detonated close to ground or or much higher up. And if you're actually in that situation, you're not going to know. Okay. Uh, But within five to 10 minutes of the actual explosion, everything important will have happened already. Okay. So if you can kind of peek outside and you see some kind of avenue for escape, you might take it. Um, But you're not going to have a lot of useful information. And communication systems are almost certainly going to be down. You're not going to get guidance. You're probably on your own. Okay. And um, again, your, your best shot is probably just get away if you possibly can get away. And they always talk about like, you know, which way the wind's blowing. I'm like, man, I'm not going to know which way the wind's blowing. <laughs> if a nuke surprises me, I'm not going to be like licking my finger in the wind going, well, it's radiation's going that way. So is it? Well, I, you, could I, probably, you could probably judge, say, from clouds okay. within, a, within a relatively short time, which way the wind is blowing. And yeah, that's right. You want to get upwind. And that's and just drive the opposite way if you can. Yeah, because the fallout, all the radioactive fallout will be downwind. Yeah, that was always my concern is like, because we live just outside of LA and it's like, if there's a huge disaster, I wonder if, I guess, psychologically, if there's been any like, you know, studies about in huge, colossal uh, catastrophes, what people tend to do. Do they stay home? Do they try to get on the freeway? In every Hollywood movie, everyone's on the freeway packing it up. It's a mix of the of the two, to be honest. Okay. Yeah. yeah and the, 
freeways are going to be jammed. No question. Okay. Yeah. So for me, <clears throat> but LA, I think like your winds are almost always westerly, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Off the ocean. Yeah. Seems that way a lot. Yeah. And if it's, you know, a nuclear, big nuclear war, big target's going to be down Coronado, San Diego, right? The yeah. naval base. So if you can go sort of north and to the coast, that'd be my knee jerk reaction in LA. Okay. <laughs> I don't try to remember my LA uh, no. <laughs> geography here, but. So I guess there's no, uh, what the way it sounds is like people or the government puts out these like to-do lists, like this is what you need to do during a nuclear attack. And these are the things that are going to help you. Is that just to make you feel good? You know, assuming that you're not far enough away to where it's like just minimizing radiation. Are these things, you know, if you're getting the initial like blast coming over you, your building still stands, but then the radiation. Now, when you talk about that radiation blast coming, is that an initial like burst of radiation just spills out? Yeah, it's an initial burst that it lasts only less than a second. Okay. So that initial wave of radiation is different kind from the later wave. But, you know, you don't have to worry too much about it. the later stuff. That's the really worrisome stuff because you can get some isotopes that have a very long half-life. And if you're exposed to them or ingest them, all of a sudden you're living with radiation that you didn't want to have in there. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's important to be upwind. But you don't want to be downwind and, and you know, fallout is all over the place. You don't want to kick up soils in the aftermath of yeah. a nuclear attack yeah. because all the heavy isotopes are going to be down settling in those soils. And, you know, if you ingest them or something, that's bad news. And if that stuff comes down to the air, I mean, is that, and I might sound very ignorant with this statement here, but is that just something that's passing through walls? I mean, it's just eating it through. I mean, nothing's going to, unless it's cement or brick, it's not stopping. It's yeah, no, I mean, cement, cement will shield you. To some okay. extent, right? So there are lots of materials that will actually help shield you from radiation. Because I saw the same people saying, well, tape the cracks in your door of your house and like do all this stuff to minimize radiation. I mean, is that, that's, that's BS, right? Yeah, yeah pretty much. <laughs> okay. um, but, but, you know, it is important to bear in mind that we're actually way more resilient to radiation than we used to think. Oh, okay. Uh, so, you know, the total number of people who died as a result of radiation exposure Mm -hmm. um, from both atomic weapons that blew up in Japan, all the atomic tests that were conducted above ground, the Chernobyl disaster, Fukushima. It's like orders of magnitude less than what we would have expected early when we didn't really understand the nature of radiation. So, okay. you know, it's you don't want it. It's not great for you to have a heavy dose of radiation if you can avoid it. Mm -hmm. But it's less likely to do you in than we used to think it was. Okay. So most of the deaths from a nuclear explosion would be blast deaths and heat deaths. Okay. And does the heat, the heat that would cause death actually go out a little bit further than like what's, you know, the radius of like leveled build buildings? Or is that kind of all contained into that, that initial blast area? The actual temperature does drop off with distance quite dramatically. Okay. So you know, you could be a couple of miles from a big nuclear explosion and you'll survive no problem. You'll survive the blast. You'll survive the heat. Or uh, even more significantly, I would say, if it's a significant, if you're in a nuclear war with lots of nuclear weapons going off in all kinds of places, it's the food distribution systems, the energy distribution systems, you know, the, the clean water supply systems. These are the things that are going to break down and you're in trouble. And it's not a direct result of the nuclear attack. It's the fact that all of a sudden you, everything you depended on uh -huh. is no longer available to you. That sounds absolutely terrible. <laughs> you know, the half-life of some of these isotopes that are generated by nuclear weapons, very long. Um, cesium-137, the half-life is like 30 years. Strontium-90, the half-life is like 28 years. Good news is these are big, heavy molecules, and they settle out relatively quickly. Okay. So they'll be on the ground okay. for too long. And so that's why you don't want to kick up that dust. You know, you certainly don't. I had a lot of people ask me after the Fukushima disaster, is it safe to go to Japan? Mm. And my answer was always, yeah, perfectly safe as long as you don't eat the dirt. Okay. Which we don't do. Yeah. So, so it's, you know, just a little prudence in terms of that kind of thing. Uh-huh. 
How fast does that, those waves coming out, the shock wave and the air blast, how many miles per hour are those things going? Faster than the speed of sound. Jeez. Yeah. yeah. I've seen some of those old videos of like uh, World War II tests and they like HD them and then like they show like the trees and stuff and just that yeah. you get way older. Very, very dramatic. Yeah. And how long if you get the the blindness from looking at the that's not permanent right that's just a matter of minutes before that comes back in terms of if you saw the mushroom or the initial explosion the flash blindness doesn't normally last too long okay so you need kind of a long exposure to very intense light to actually permanently damage the retina okay but you know your reflex if you see a bright flash is to look away yeah this is kind i mean of- if, you, if you really want to survive nuclear war you do what the survivalists do in idaho you know what? You you get that cabin out in the middle of the woods, and you stock it up with all those supplies, and you take you know survival training, and you learn how to hunt your own game, and you know live off the land. You do all that stuff. Is that a worthwhile investment? I would never never do that. Like yeah. life life is too short as it is. I'm not spending time and energy preparing for a low probability event. Yeah. And if there is a nuclear war, to be honest, I've led a good life. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know that I want to live in a post-apocalyptic world. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't, it sounds terrible. And I, and I, I also read about, I guess, is there some kind of rain that happened after Japan that they saw like the radiation or how, how does that work? And what is that? So was, you're talking about the black rain. Yeah. So that was particulate that had been kicked up into the atmosphere and then dropped back down in the form of rain because there was a lot of moisture in the area. So they had a lot of radioactive soils and soot and dust and so on coming back down in the rain. Regarding Japan, you know, there's so much debate about the use of nukes, whether it, you know, save lives, hurt lives. Obviously it's horrific, especially in hindsight. How do you view that in history? Um, Not to get, I guess, political or anything, but how do you view the use of nukes? And do you view them as, do you think it's saving more lives as weird as that is to say, having these around, having multiple countries with them, keeping people from getting into wars with each other. Do you think there's a benefit to them being in existence? So I think the world would be better off without any of them at all. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I just think they, you know, their utility is so unlikely in any sort of plausible real world case that, you know, the horrific consequences always going to outweigh whatever benefit there is. And if there is a benefit, it's going to be a benefit probably to a small number of people, maybe one leader or something. So I would prefer the world just didn't have any. Uh, if I'd been American president in 1945, would I have authorized the use of the atomic bombs in Japan? I'd like to think that the answer is no, I would not have done uh, because it was pretty horrific. And, you know, it's war crime. It was targeting cities. It was targeting civilians. Those mm-hmm. weren't really military targets of any. So, you know, if my view is if you're in a war and if the war is just, and you have to target things, you should be targeting military things. Mm-hmm. You shouldn't be targeting innocent civilians. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, the temptation, the psychological temptation to do it at the time must have been amazingly strong. I mean, the American had been in this war for years. It had been brutal. It had been really nasty. Uh, both sides had done awful things to each other. And you know, this probably was this visceral sense in which they deserve it, you know. And I don't want to be the guy who has that reaction. But it's not difficult for me to imagine people in that circumstance mm-hmm. ha- having that reaction. And along those lines, it's uh, you see websites, you see people, activists trying to push for disarmament uh, in the world. And me kind of being pessimistic, I don't think that'll ever happen. I think we, you mentioned it earlier, Russia never is going to get rid of everything just based on its deterrent value. Um, I think there'll come a time when there are no nuclear weapons. And okay. I, I don't know what has to happen between now and then. I hope it isn't some sort of massive cataclysm that you know, persuades us just never to go there again. Mm. Uh, I think at some point we're going to realize that, you know, we're all worse off with these things around. Now I'm encouraged that, you know, very few countries have them and only the United States 
and Russia have very large arsenals. Like China, France, and Britain, they're not that big. India, not that big. Israel, not that big. Korea, maybe a few dozen, probably not that big. So, you know, if you get nuclear war between any, well, America, Russia, Britain, France, China, if those are involved in a nuclear war, that's really bad news. Mm -hmm. But Israel, North Korea, India, Pakistan, you know, they'd be local disasters, but they wouldn't be global disasters. Before we go, I had kind of two little subjects I wanted to hit, hit you with real quick. Uh, one being, I saw some of your your tweets about China, Taiwan. Um, that seems like the next conflict coming down the pipe. How do you feel that playing out? I know it's a complicated subject, but and how, do you think there will be an armed conflict for that? Well, I worry about that a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is one of those issues where it seems like Chinese people and the Chinese leadership are kind of irrational about it. And they just got their mind around the idea that Taiwan is a part of China and it's unacceptable for it not at some point to be reunited with China. And you know, when people get that mindset, they do extreme things and they take big gambles. And I do worry about that a lot. Now, do you think that we will, there's, you know, cause there's always the talk of, Oh, we say we're going to do this. We say we're going to do that, but we don't actually follow through with it. Do you think we would go to war with China over that? No question. Okay. That's no doubt in my no doubt in my mind. There's such a strong bipartisan consensus in Washington on the importance of defending Taiwan. Yeah. So when Joe Biden the other day said, "Yeah, of course we'd go to war," <laughs> like the guy was just speaking the truth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everybody's like, oh, "Change in American policy," and then the White House walked it back. Oh, there's no change in American policy. But you know what? He was just saying what he thought. Yeah. And I don't think that's necessarily unhelpful. I think that might have been a very positive thing to do. Yeah, because uh, China's president, it almost seems like a, a Putin thing where it's like a legacy. It's like, I'm going to reunify uh, this old I, territory. I worry about that. I worry about that. Yeah. I guess the hope is that they're more cunning and shrewd and they're going to like play the long game versus like, oh, we're just going to kind of throw the world economy into chaos with a war with the U.S. You I think hope they just need to get their mind around the fact that Taiwan's not part of China and it's not coming back. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was only part of China for 200 years. So in the grand sweep of history, it wasn't that long. Mm -hmm. And it was only part of China because the Qing dynasty basically colonized it. Okay. So you know, it was a settler colonial occupation. So where else in the world do we justify that kind of thing? We don't. I heard that the Chinese military has been preparing for shallow water warfare in the, the the ocean there and the u.s has been kind of lagging and we kind of still sticking to the massive carriers and operating off of those is there any truth to that so both sides are trying to design around the other side's apparent advantages mm -hmm. so you do see a lot of like attempts to be ingenious about finessing problems that you can identify uh, a lot of americans talk to me about the simulations, the war games, and they consistently tell me that in these war games on, you know, Chinese attack on Taiwan, China wins. Hmm. This mystifies me. I don't, I don't understand this at all because they just don't have that kind of amphibious capability. Um, they can't expect to be able to land significant numbers of troops on Taiwanese airfields if they attack. Uh, they seem to be reliant on things like civilian ferries and small private boats and fishing boats to get troops to Taiwan. Those kinds of things actually need wharves to tie up to. They need jetties. Like Taiwanese are not going to be saying, here, use our ports. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's very inhospitable land for, you know, amphibious operations. Very few good beaches. The beaches are pretty well prepped. For defense. Like, I just don't see how this works. I, I see how China can do a lot of damage to Taiwan, but you want China, you want Taiwan to be part of China. A really bad way to go about that is to start by damaging them heavily. Do you have a timetable in your head where this might come to a head? Because there's a lot of talk about it. Is it. Do you think it'll be a kind of a continuous longer process before we get to a potential conflict? I don't know. I, I don't have a crystal ball. Kevin Rudd did say the other day that he thought the Ukraine experience has kind of dissuaded China mm -hmm. and that it's going to be maybe 10 years before they would try anything. Okay. 
Um, but Let that's Kevin Rudd. Down. Yeah, if Kevin Rudd he knows a lot about China, uh, so I wouldn't necessarily discount that. Okay. But that's just his view. Yeah. Uh, and will Xi Jinping be in power in ten years? And will the next person care as much about this as he seems to? You know, big question marks. Mm -hmm. I, I personally think China is in trouble, and I'm not sure they're going to be able to afford that kind of adventurism anyway. Okay. I mean, their economy is slowing. They have an incredibly quickly aging population, only a middle income country. They're really going to suffer from climate change. Like they're very exposed to sea level rise. Their water supplies are already stretched massively. They've got energy supply problems. They've got desertification problems. There's just a whole long list of challenges domestically that China's going to have to try to deal with one way or another. Uh, on top of trying to keep everybody, you know, on the same page, they, you know, trying to eliminate any possible opposition to Communist Party rule. They've got their hands full. Yeah, <laughs> it's interesting you phrase it that way. Take on Taiwan, right? Take yeah. <laughs> on Taiwan, really? You want this? That's interesting because you don't hear what you just said. It's not the narrative that you hear a no. lot watching no, the news. Why is it. that? I don't think people pay attention. I just think people okay. look at historical growth rates and assume they're going to continue. Yeah, because the story is, oh, China's taking us over in terms of economic growth and militarily, and we're going to become the second rate power to them, and they're going to take over the world. I don't buy it. Okay. That's good to know. Good to hear. The United States has, you know, room for, for growth. China has less room for growth. Last question before I let you go. And if you have no opinion about it, totally fine. UFOs. I have to ask you because you've been, you have, I, and I think what it stemmed from is with the nuclear sites and there's reports about things shutting it down. And then there's all, all these governments and now everybody's investigating UFOs. We're having uh, congressional hearings about it. And it's like, I'm on the fence about it. I'm open to it because of the people who've talked about it and like the Fravers and the military pilots and everything and saying, Hey, well, we're seeing weird stuff. And, but I'm perplexed by the government's response in terms of entertaining, entertaining what would be historically considered a really silly idea. If there's nothing to it, why do we keep fueling this fire? Even if you want to cover, you know, black projects and like, you can get plenty of military funding, just talking about China and Russia. You don't need to bring in a space aliens into this whole equation. Have you paid attention to this at all? And what do you think about it? A little bit, not a lot. You know, it's mm -hmm. like the Kennedy assassination. Like, I'll spend 10 minutes on it, but don't try to get me to spend a lifetime on it. <laughs> like, are there UFOs? Yeah, there's stuff out there we haven't identified. So technically, yes. Are there alien spacecraft visiting Earth? Uh, I've seen no hard evidence okay. of any kind anywhere. And uh, if I were an intelligent alien species, would I send spacecraft to Earth? Mm -hmm. um, well, I might, depends on why I might want to do that. Uh, but presumably, most of the time, a good reason to do that would be to actually contact intelligent life on Earth. So if they're flying around, uh, why aren't they saying hello? Mm -hmm. Like, what's with all the stealth? And yeah. uh, are there actually aliens on these things? There is no way I would send a biological life form at interstellar distances on any spacecraft. I mean, that's just an invitation for things to go wrong. Think mm -hmm. about like the life support system and the energy requirements involved in keeping a biological life form alive at interstellar distances and over that time scale. Like, unless they've figured out some way to fold space the way that happens in Herbert uh, in, in Dune, like, I don't know, yeah. I don't see it. So, I don't know, they'd be robotic. Yeah. There wouldn't be life forms in them. And, yeah. Uh, you know, there's what's the upside to not letting us know that they're alien? I don't get that. How do you view the the political government response and kind of the whole show that's going on? Do you feel like that's orchestrated in some way to like, I don't know, get people's attention off of other secret military things? Or is it just the government's that inept and doesn't really know I, what's going on either? I don't think they care. <laughs> I think yeah. they've got their hands full with other things. And this is just such a niche thing. And it's mm -hmm. been such a niche crowd that's been wailing about this for years. Like, mm -hmm. why would you even bother spending time, a lot of time and money dealing with the public relations issue? It's not even that big a public relations issue. Yeah. Just go over here and have your side show. <laughs> it, it, it's like, you know, the, they faked the moon landing thing, right? NASA oh, had yeah. a meeting and they thought about what's our strategy for combating the we faked the moon landing. 
And they decided, you know what? Let's not dignify it by giving it any attention at all. Mm-hmm. They just didn't bother yeah. trying to respond to it. So, you know, good on them. Governments are busy. Let's yeah. have them spend their time on things that are important. The true. Well, I can't thank you enough for spending the time and answering questions on this. I know it's something that I've always been thinking about for a while here. Um, I can't say it. it don't worry my, about it too much. Yeah, to be I, can't, I, I can't say it improved my worrying at all, but I kind of accepted the fact like, hey, if it, if the crap hits the fan, it's it's whatever. It's over. Probably. If anybody wants to kind of find out more about you or check out the books you've written, any places they can go to kind of get that information? Uh, I am Googleable. Um, I'm not necessarily a great self promoter. Mm-hmm. Uh, so <laughs> a lot of, <laughs> a lot of other people that have a lot of better places to point you to, uh, you can follow me on Twitter. If you want David A. Welch, uh, I don't tweet a lot. I'm just sort of when the mood strikes and when I think I might have something worth saying, I have a comment about some news article, but I, I'm not a very aggressive Twitterer. So, well, it's, it's like a job in and of itself. If you ever want to market yourself, it's like so time consuming. And then in, in secondly, it's like people tend to tweet every little thought that pops in their head, yeah. every little piece of food that they eat. So it's nice that you, you it's just pick me. the important <laughs> stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I'm Googleable. We'll see. Right, sounds good, sir. Find, yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate yeah, it. Thanks for the invitation. 